Behind me is a familiar symbol of good times on hot nights at Brooklyn's playground by the sea. But the Coney Island I visited with reporter Roseanne Alessandro is unfamiliar, unseen, and often ignored. Show free. Uh, stand there and don't move until I tell you. I'm gonna let you go in and see the show free. You hear me? He's starting another new show. You've just been done. Now hurry, you'll be gone. Nostalgia is what you can feel for something that once was, like an amusement park in its heyday. Just north of the Coney Island rides are some people who want to keep their neighborhood from fading into history. Italian neighborhood just north of the amusement area. This is regarded as Coney Island's only stable neighborhood, and its residents are afraid they'll lose it. The Coney Island that surrounds it is regarded as one of the city's worst slums. These houses are structurally sound and very well kept, but some stand next to empty lots, and some empty lots hold heavy machines or garbage trucks, so the neighborhood may appear blighted. A blighted neighborhood invites urban renewal. Coney Island's general blight brought high-rise housing projects for poor people in the West End, for example, but that did not solve the problems. In fact, the incomplete redevelopment of the West End has created many new problems. A heavy concentration of poor people, inadequate shopping and city services, bad roads, ramshackle housing that survived renewal, and of course, crime. Part of the Italian neighborhood is designated for urban renewal, too and the people looking toward the West End say they don't want it. Even though the city has no money for new projects now, the people are afraid of what may come, and they are uneasy with the uncertainty of their lives. Their homes could be condemned and the neighborhood wiped out. The people also fear the encroachment of industry. Their neighborhood is a target for the city's economic development program, and so far the results have proved offensive. When your community is zoned for industry, you're not allowed to build a house, and you can't develop a residential neighborhood. The 51st state has often looked at neighborhoods like the North Side and Clinton, where people have fought government to protect their homes. This story of Coney Island's Italian neighborhood concerns a similar fight, significant because the community is organizing before a crisis, and because it is trying to plan its own future with grassroots leadership. Now, I have five children. My children are going to grow up in this neighborhood, they're going to grow up safe. I have a mother who's in her 60s. I'm not about to, to have her moved out of this area. We, she may find fault with me and I may disagree with my mother. But she's my mother, the woman who bought me. And damn it, anybody who wants to come down and put her out of that house has to step over Ralph Perfetto. Ralph Perfetto is a man driven to perfect himself and his neighborhood. He earns his living as traffic manager for a steel fabricator in Queens. Well, let him get past him. He graduated from Grady Vocational and Technical High School in Brooklyn and at the age of 39 is studying business administration nights at Kingsborough Community College. He is a natural leader. Perfetto was rallying his friends against landlords who let houses run down while they collect high rents from welfare. They say the city's going to take the neighborhood anyway. Okay, I'll see. I'll see. Thank you. Perfetto is a warm, engaging man, but he will admit that he can be abrasive. Oh, yeah. I want to make sure we keep it His targets are private garbage companies and the city, which let them into his neighborhood. Oh, that's our friend Kelly. I know. Hi. How, how well I know. Yeah. We gotta keep on fighting, that's all. That's all. Just keep on his back. Don't give up. Uh, I won't. Don't Just worry. keep me posted. I will. Take care, man. 
Okay, Chrissy, let's go. A neighborhood like this one comes into contact with government through devices set up by City Hall to improve services or to make people feel someone downtown cares. Those devices and their directors get mixed reviews from people like Ralph Perfetto. In the, in the mid-60s, when everybody was militant, there was a turbulent era, and everybody was yelling for something or other in every part of the city, every corner of the country. So we weren't unique. We didn't have a problem that could stand out. So we had in our area, before we had a task force, we had an area services agency. We were very fortunate, and we did sit back a bit because we're very fortunate. We had a man who worked very much with us, Rabbi Edgar Bluff. You remember? Okay. Then we came in with our task force. And our task force, again, we were fortunate. Now, Rabbi Bluff was a tough act to follow because he was a sweetheart of a guy. Okay? Now, then we got old Scratchy Kretschmer. He came in to browbeat the people and to sit there with his egotistical mustache and tell you how great he was. On the desk and scratching. Just be on the desk and scratching. Scratchy Kretschmer. That's him. We know him in this area. I don't know how they know him in the city of New York. Jerome, the Honorable Commissioner, Jerome Kretschmer over here, Scratchy Kretschmer. That's all. But there's nothing. Now, now after that, after that, we got, we got a real winner. At least, at least Kretschmer, there was one thing about Kretschmer, you couldn't be indifferent to him. You hated him, but you weren't indifferent. I know. Okay. Now we got a winner. This man died, but he forgot to lay down. Oh, my God. Ed Faber. <laughs> the worst task force chairman in the city of New York. Perfetto stepped aside as president of this neighborhood improvement organization last year when he felt his abrasiveness might be hurting his neighbors. But many of them now appear to want him back in office. Before we pick up the story of how they are carrying on the fight to preserve their homes, we want you to meet some of the friends and neighbors Ralph Perfetto introduced to us. You're charging. What are you, kidding? How are we going to get rich? Right? I own this house here, I own the house around the corner, I don't own this property here. That doesn't mean because I'm not here, my heart ain't here. Why do I my money is here? Even besides the money, it's your heart, Larry. This, 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 is, this is where you were born and raised. This is your, your 25 neighborhood. 25 years ago, when I first started this building, I had 16 no, cents to buy this, Larry. Let me ask you this, Larry. You were cousins, right? Could you fly these pigeons in Howard Beach? Right over here. From when you, you right. were here, from when you were a kid, your heart was with pigeons. Right? That's right. This is the best pigeon coop in the whole city of New York. You should put this here. You know, you should, you filled this here. You should put from rags to riches. Mr. Dacker, show equity of $600,000, $700,000. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Made it with two hands, working hard. Right here. Tony Allen bought it. Oh, I don't want to be knocked out of business. They put it, come here for big buildings. Where are they going to put me? Howard Beach? You're kidding me? I'll be the only, I'll be the only Italian guy out there with all the Jewish people. They converted my wife. I had such a nice Italian wife. Now we eat Chinese food every Thursday night. You can't try without chicken bucket. Are you kidding? <laughs> I never had that in my life. I love pizza macaroni. My wife says, I don't have to no more. She forgot. The Jew the Jewish girls. Got two sets of dishes. Are you kidding? That's right. <laughs> the Jewish girls forget about it. They converted my wife. <laughs> this is why I get nervous when a customer I come up here. Pet where is she? Come on, girl, where are you? Come on. Come uh, on. Racing pigeon? Yeah, it's a racing pigeon, yeah. She won the 300 mile race for me last year. Come on, girl. Come on. Come on. Hey, stop being so shy. <laughs> You've invested a lot of money in this pigeon coop. Well, the coop itself cost me about fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars The pigeons are untold, and they got us how much of this. I mean, you could go buy that pigeon, I wouldn't sell that pigeon for a thousand dollars. He's famous, that kid. Which kid? That one right there, sell it. What year was that you caught that ball? 1961. 1961. He's the ball that caught Roger Maris' home run ball, the 61st home run ball. See? That kid right there. They still have it, sell! No, he sold it. $610, he gave the ball back to the guy. <laughs> 